This is our e-reader panel, and I want to thank them all for participating. I know they've all um, had some dealings with us in various ways, and so they're each going to talk about that. And all, all of their stuff, if they had a handout, will be posted online, so you can find all that there. Uh, Diana Weaver is the director at Baser Community Library in Baser. Um, that's the name, right? Yes. Okay. Jeff Tate is the digital neighborhood librarian here at Topeka Public. A uh, job he's been in for you know, like a year and a half, two years. A oh, while. Wow. Oh, man, I lost track of time. Uh, Jack Granite is the branch manager for the, it's not Argentina, South, South. South. <laughs> branch <laughs> of KCK Public. Um, Brad Allen is the director at Lawrence <coughs> Public. And Alex Mudd is a assistant professor. Reference and instruction. I don't, I'm not comfortable with the term assistant okay. professor. He's a librarian. Yeah at Emporia State, and so they are also doing something on campus. So we've got a little bit of everything here, um, large libraries, smaller libraries, and academic libraries. So I'm going to let Diana start, and no questions. <laughs> Thank you, <Diana. laughs> um, So at Baser, we've been circulating e-readers preloaded with content for about a year. Uh, we have 10 different devices. We have Kindles, Nook Colors, we have a Kobo, uh, two Barnes & Noble Nook Touches, and two Sony readers. And the reason why we have so, such a variety is that um, it started with a tech toolbox that was purchased a uh, short time before I became director of the library. And we, after the staff used it a little bit, we actually started a community users group and we invited members of the community to come in and be part of an eight-week eight experiment where we used all of these devices in a, in a program that we kind of modeled after American Idol. We, you know, auditioned them all and saw which ones we liked about, which one was better for the reading experience, which one was easiest to shop with, which one was the easiest to read on the comfort level. And, um, and then after we did that with the community focus group, we had these devices, and so we decided we would go ahead and start checking them out. Um, so we checked them out in bags like this, which is you can buy from Amazon for about $10 or $15, um, and I'll pass this around, but what we have in them is the device itself, which we barcode and check out. We have a user's agreement, which I'll talk about a little bit more about in a minute. Um, we have the startup guide that comes with each of the device. And then um, side pocket, we've got a cord that goes with it. So um, when we started to do, go ahead and do this, I did a lot of research on user's agreements. And I found some really long ones, some of them five to seven pages. And I really wanted something that was like one half of a sheet of paper, maybe front and back, that could go easily into the package. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pass this around so you can look at it. But our service agreement basically says that um, the patron understands that they're responsible for any information that they put on the device. If they have it, they put bookmarks, logins to uh, Wi-Fi spots and that kind of stuff. It's their responsibility to take it off. We're not going to be responsible for it. If heaven forbid they were silly enough to put their credit card information on it, we're not responsible. The user's agreement said, please don't do this. Um, if the device is damaged during the time it's checked out, the <coughs> cost replace is $125. Uh, charging ca the charging cable is $10 to replace. The bag to replace is $15. There's a $20 fee if you would put it in the drop box. Don't do that. Um, we will charge you $20 if you do that. Um, so, and only use the power adapter and cable for charging. And then um, we check these out for two weeks with two renewals. So we check them out just about the same as an audio book. Because, and really when you, as the price is coming down, there, some of them are cheaper than some of the audio books that you buy. Um, so, and then on the back, we keep their name and their library card number. When it comes back, we check, make sure everything's there, make sure they didn't put anything on it or delete anything off of it, and that's all we do. And then we get ready to check it back out. Um, as far as content, we, um, I loaded 
content on them. Um, as in, in the first, at first, we loaded different series on them because that was one way that we found we could really market it. So we loaded the Hunger Games series on them. So when they'd come and they'd say, well, I'm ready for the second book of Hunger Games. Um, where am I on the hold list? Well, you're number 23 on the hold list, but we have them all loaded on this device. Would you like to try the Kindle or would you like to try a Nook? And people were really excited about that. And we did it with the Fifty Shades of Grey as well. And of course, that was really exciting for people. <laughs> um, so, and then we've also loaded themes onto them like um, Nicholas Sparks type light romances, um, mystery themed. Uh, Harlequin books are really cheap to buy, so we have a Harlequin theme. Um, I manage the content through online accounts like Amazon.com account, Barnes & Noble account. That way you can kind of send what you want. I don't want to load these things up with 50 titles because that's overwhelming for people as well as they can't read them all in that length of time. So I try to manage that through the online account. It's a lot easier than trying to manage it from the devices. Uh, I think if I were to do it over again, or as start from finish, start the project, I would pick one single device, like all Kindles or all Nooks, just because if you went to uh, buy the Hunger Games, for instance, you have to buy it for the Amazon, uh, for the Kindle, you have to buy it for the Nook. So you have to repurchase because you can't um, buy one and use it on multiple devices. There is a software called Caliber that you can use to kind of go around that, but it doesn't always work, and it doesn't work with Kindles. Um, when you start the program, you have to have an email address. So I just set up a, a high tech at baserlibrary.org email account just for all of our devices. You have to have a credit card attached to them. You just have to. That's part of the way when you, just like when you do your Kindle for yourself, you have to have an email address or a credit card. So what I did, I just went to Walmart and bought a $25 Visa card and attached that to the device, to the account. Um, and it long, long since expired, but um, I use gift cards now to add content on them. Um, I, we're going to mark, we've had 136 checkouts since we've had them in the year that we've had them. We're, things have kind of tapered off, so we're going to have a big push this summer on take e-reader for vacation with you because to me that's what e-readers are great for is taking them on vacation. The way I look at it uh, is that this is a service to the community. Um, it's a, a for, way for people to learn about e-readers and nooks and all these things that they hear about. Um, so I'm not too worried about all the copyright. It's like Jessamine said this morning, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Are they really going to come after me? I'm not really too worried about it. Um, so we do it from an educational point of view and um, it's really fun. To, to say to somebody, oh, you ought to try a, a Kindle, and well, I've always wanted to try a Kindle, and so they try it, they come back. Some people will say, oh, I went out and bought one, this is the greatest thing ever, and other people will come back and say, you know, this was great, thank you, but I'd really rather have a book. So, um, I think that's about all I have. Um, I'm Jeff Tate. I'm with the Topeka Public Library. Uh, we have a, a smaller program. Uh, when we were looking at uh, circulating e-readers, we decided that uh, we didn't want to invest in the amount of devices it was going to take to circulate for all of our population was going to be a little bit more than what we wanted to spend. So we decided to uh, kind of look at a small pilot project to see if, if it would even be popular here in Topeka. Um, and as I was looking at sort of where to start the, uh, the pilot, one of the initial reasons that we thought that it would be nice to get um, an e-reader is that you can change the font, it's smaller, you can store a bunch of books on it. Um, so we have a department called uh, Red Carpet, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's actually uh, 
they deal with homebound patrons, nursing homes, <clears throat> excuse me, um, individuals with vision problems, um, things like that. So we thought that would be a natural department. They also have the large print books to kind of start the pilot there because that seemed to be a natural fit for us to take an e-reader out to uh, those individuals and then all of a sudden our entire collection is now open to them because um, not every book is printed in large print, uh, not every uh, book that you can sort of get in large print you can actually hold because they're just super big. Um, so we started a new project. Um, we bought 15 uh, simple touch nooks. Uh, we got also got fancy bags with the with the um, uh, connector in there. Uh, we have instructions. We have a survey. And uh, the nice thing about uh, the red carpet pilot is that we also the staff that are doing it. We wanted to make it easy for for staff. We didn't want to have to go through the process of hooking things up with a visa and wiping the devices off. So the red carpet staff already deal with adaptation devices and magnifiers, and so they're kind of used to that, so that would be a good sort of uh, thing uh, to start with. We also, uh, as I was doing research, uh, found out that Barnes & Noble actually has this program called Business to Business. Uh, it was designed for sort of administrative where, you know, the heads of the company could push out books to, to managers and things like that. So what happens is, Staff actually don't do really anything with the devices as far as putting content on them. Uh, what we do is we just order books straight from Barnes & Noble and they, uh, through the business to business program, they wirelessly send it to the device so the next time you turn on the, the simple touch, it uh, just starts downloading. Um, so it makes it very nice. We don't have to worry about if somebody were, they also lock the devices down. So there really is no way, well, there is probably a way that they could <laughs> wipe out the devices, um, but theoretically they shouldn't get in be able to do anything other than uh, get to the book and then read it. Um, the shop is locked down, the internet's locked down. Um, it's very much just, here's uh, the e-reader, find the book you like and start reading. Um, we also thought that would be, you know, with a tablet or with some devices, there's just a lot to do and we thought, Keeping it simple, keeping it sort of just in that reading, getting the books sort of philosophy would be much easier than <coughs> trying to come up with instructions on how to download apps and get to overdrive and do all these other kind of things. Um, and so far it's been working uh, really well with that. Um, so the business to business uh, program, um, it's nice because it locks everything down. We don't have to really worry about that. Uh, we also get content. Um, we don't have to worry about some of those legal gray areas because Barnes & Noble works with us so they know that we're lending these devices out so uh, management was happy to you know kind of go that direction as well. Um, so we've been circulating uh, the 15 e-readers since uh, February, well March 1st would probably be when they got started circulating. We've had 32 checkouts um, for the 15 devices which is actually pretty good when each device is uh, circulated for roughly two weeks. Uh, the red carpet actually, they have a schedule and they go out to the different uh, nursing homes and things uh, uh, every two weeks instead of three weeks, otherwise uh, they can have it as long as they want. Um, and uh, so far, um, customers love it um, for the reasons that we thought they would. Um, they now have access to big books like The Passage, the vampire novel, and the which in a large print is just like uh, <laughs> this big. Um, and they can read, hold it in their hands and, you know, and they can read that. Uh, also, they can get like the Fifty Shades of Grey, which didn't come in large print. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, we, and then we actually kind of went a different way. We wanted to give them, instead of doing themes, we decided let's just give them everything and then they just so that each person could find something that they <coughs> kind of might like. So we actually bought 73 and put 73 titles on each device. Um, that's just the amount we could get for the 6,000 that we initially uh, uh, earmarked for the, uh, for the project. Um, and that uh, we worked with the same selectors that did the, the large print or large print ordering. So they knew what these customers already wanted and what they couldn't get and what they might like. So it has 
all the popular titles, all the, the big thick books that you just couldn't read. So it was very nice to have a, a dedicated group of staff who kind of knew what the, the customers uh, worked for. Um, so all in all, it's, it's going real well. Um, staff like it. Uh, our customers are, are really raving. Uh, the next step is um, to sort of take it out of the red carpet um, environment and sort of figure out a way to, to push it out to, uh, to library users. Um, we're thinking, you know, we're not sure if we're ready to go that full step, uh, buying a lot of devices that get obsolete the moment you take them out of the box is, is not really a road we want to take right now. So it's how do we get that same sort of uh, segment of the population. We know there's a lot of people that red carpet uh, doesn't get to that might use the devices for the same reason because they're, they're lightweight and they use large print. Um, but how do you put something, you know, circulating without saying, hey, this is only for, you know, 50 year olds or whatever. <laughs> you must be this age impaired to <laughs> um, So, you know, there's some, some uh, challenges when it comes to to sort of going to that to, to large scale. But we're giving it some time in the pilot project. We just got it started. So. That's pretty much my skill we can talk about here. So. Well, in uh, Kansas City, Kansas, we were building a new branch called the South Branch. And uh, uh, the community raised $2 million of the $6 million total for that, and so we were going to do pretty much anything they asked us to do. And uh, they made it really clear that they wanted us to circulate e-readers. So uh, we did that. We bought 10 nooks, and we preloaded them with, uh, with, with content, uh, divided them up by genre for the most part, um, though we have two uh, nooks that are grab bags. Um, so uh, we opened it uh, in September 26th, and um, so that's about seven months, and they have circulated 63 times, so it's 10 nooks, so 6.3 per nook, which was about twice uh, the, the rate that Philadelphia um, served in a, in a similar period of time, so I think we're doing okay, though they were not too happy with their, their uh, serves. Um, but um, we served them for three weeks, so you can kind of do the math, and that, so, you know, that, that's pretty good. They're, they're out most of the time. Um, I just kind of want to walk through the uh, decisions that we had to make in putting this uh, program together. Um, obviously, the first one is uh, what hardware are you going to are you going to buy? Um, we went with the Nooks uh, largely because it was the cheapest. We were thinking in terms of replacement costs. We wanted to keep that price as low as possible. Um, you could get a, a, a Nook color. You can go up to, to tablets and, and such, and obviously Kindles. But all of that costs costs more. Um, so we went with the, the cheapest, um, just in terms of replacement costs. Um, so what Jeff was talking about, the difference between or the, the uh, business to business model is another decision that you have to make because the, uh, the alternative to that is the, uh, the consumer um, managed content model um, where you use your credit card and all of that. So those are two different models with, with the Nook that you have those options. Um, the advantage to the consumer uh, model is that you can take one title and put it on multiple devices. I couldn't get a straight answer from Barnes & Noble about how many you're allowed to put it on, but I did uh, see Mentor Public Library in Ohio was putting it on six different devices, one title on six different devices. That would be a pretty big uh, advantage, but uh, uh, we went with the other route because um, we, uh, we wanted to be able to just fax them a purchase order, they load it for us, um, no credit card involved, and, and, and uh, a lot easier for acquisitions um, as well. So that's what we went with. Um, on both uh, models, uh, it's important that the content stays with your account, not with the device. So you lose the device, they can break that and move it onto another device. So you're not really, when you're circulating a nook with lots of material on it, you're not at risk of losing all of that material. Um, so the next thing to decide is the accessories uh, that go with it. And the most important of those is probably the warranty. The way Barnes & Noble works, uh, your uh, they're going to replace um, your device, no questions asked, not if it's lost, but if it's damaged. Excuse me. Um, one time within the period of the warranty. We went with a shorter one of two years, thinking they're going to get lost eventually. Um, 
but uh, you know it, it goes up from two to five years, I think, and it gets more expensive as it goes. Um, we bought the adapter, and we have a neoprene case that it, uh, for the Nook itself, <coughs> the wall adapter, so you can power it straight from the wall. You don't need to have a computer. But the uh, the neatest thing is you might have seen these on the on the internet. We're using uh, gun cases, uh, <laughs> which is good for laugh when you're purchasing. Department calls to ask about that when that one the paperwork goes through on that. <laughs> but th this costs uh, seven dollars and fifty cents, as opposed to otter boxes for electronics cost much more than that, and they're very they're very light. So I do recommend these. Um, they're they're kind of hard to open, not good for folks with arthritis. So that is uh, the main drawback there. Um, all the, uh, the drawing up the, the policies, um, the, the user agreement is. There was a lot of a lot of decision making that goes into that. I don't want to repeat everything, but can they return it in the book drop? How long are they uh, uh, are they holdable? What's the checkout period? Late fees? Who are the eligible users? Are you going to prohibit um, people from changing settings and side loading content? Um, how are you going to put the bid record together? We have all the content in the 505 field, which. Uh, it's searchable, kind of, sort of, um, but not perfect, not as good as uh, searching a regular book. Um, statistics, you know, you're, you're circulating 20 titles so far on, when you check out one book, so if you, if you did a whole lot of this, that might be kind of throwing off your statistics. And then um, advertising and training both the public and the staff, those are definitely necessary. Um, so I think those are all the, the kind of steps we went through in thinking, thinking it through, the problems that we've had so far. You know, uh, we, we kept thinking, oh, these things are going to get lost and stolen, and none have. So that, that informed a lot of our, our, our decision making, and maybe it shouldn't have. Um, we've only had one major uh, problem, which was what Jeff said can't happen. And someone restored the factory settings and knocked it out. And it took a lot of work to get it back uh, uh, to uh, working shape. Um, Barnes & Noble had trouble uh, resetting it for us. Um, recharging uh, the, the machines when they come back, a staff training issue has kind of been a problem, mainly because if you turn on that Wi-Fi switch, it kills the battery in three or four days as opposed to two months with, with the Wi-Fi off. Uh, I would say the, the last thing, it's not really a problem, but we invested in Access 360 at the same time that we did this, and they're not, in, they're not incompatible exactly, but they're sort of philosophically incompatible uh, rather than practically incompatible. So, you know, you, can down, you can't download Blio content onto these. You can download EPUB, though we've had problems with it. Um, you can get a card that makes this, it's called an N2A card, turns it into an Android operating system, and then you could download Blio. So there are all these things, you know, patrons want to take the books they see in the catalog um, and put them on these, and they can't always. So uh, the future of this kind of thing, especially with the Nook. If you if you read an article about Nook since Christmas, it probably starts with the death of. Um, <laughs> they had very poor sales. Um, so if you're if you're deciding whether to invest in this, I would take that into account. There's a general belief um, uh, that Jim mentioned to me last night right off the bat that e-readers are a transitional device. Um, we we we're all we all want devices that will act as an internet connection and a phone, and not just uh, an e-reader and we may move toward that. And then there's the legality, uh, which is just up in the air until there's a lawsuit. And, and you know, two libraries were sued um, by the uh, National Federation for the Blind, um, and those were settled out of court, so it didn't establish any kind of precedent. It was a little surprising, <clears throat> certainly unfortunate. Um, we, I think everyone expected us to get sued by publishers, not by the NFB, but um, that too, you know, are we allowed to do this? Um, still sort of needs to, to be established by, by the laws. Hi. <laughs> <clears throat> um, our approach, I guess, was pretty slim, simple and perhaps somewhat slapdash. Um, we, I've been at the library for almost a year at Lawrence Public Library, and uh, we had um, an e-reader kiosk um, where we had one of each of these devices that we've been discussing and an iPad and people could kind of play with them and they were tethered and, and I think the, the people who wanted to play with them had played with them. Um, and I don't know whether we received, a, I think we received a grant to get four of each of these, three of each of these devices, so we had 12. 
no four beats there before the iPads were not doing it. So they're whatever. So we had these things and they were sitting in the, in our IT room and in, in the basement and our technical services person and I <coughs> were sitting there looking at them and as people here had said, um, the obsolescence cycle on these things are very short and so we thought uh, maybe our public would want these instead of them rotting away down even though they don't really rot, they're made of plastic, but they're just <laughs> sitting down there collecting dust. And so we decided to just put a plan together. It's, we feel like it was a resource, it's one that we could leverage, and so we just decided what would be the best strategy. So we had these devices, it's, it's again a, a bit of a cornucopia. We have three <coughs> nooks, three of the Sony the ever popular Sony reader, and, um, <laughs> and then the other one, did I not say Kindle, whatever the other one is. Those, we have three of, four of each of those, a total of 12 devices. And so we got together with our collection management uh, team to decide how, what, what, what kind of money we wanted to spend, how we wanted to do it. We had heard a lot of the things about whether you were violating the terms of use, you know, the. The rule of six is you could pretty much just have, you can only have, if, if say you have six devices with Amazon or Nook or whatever, that's the max they'll let you use on a customer license. It's certainly not within the spirit of checking them out to do that, so we elected not to really push the envelope just in consideration of feeling that we were looking at it. Might have been the open library idea of we purchase something, we put it on a device, we're giving it to you, you're giving it back. We felt like that that was right at first sale. And so that was why we took that method and didn't really push into trying to put six on there. People have, this is like third hand information I'm giving you now, but people have said that they have <laughs> talked to Barnes and Noble and Amazon and they don't care. <laughs> so take that for what it's worth and the policy and issue component of this. Um, so we've elected to not really go that route. Um, and so we have, um, we have a couple for children, we have a couple for teens, we have, um, we have an NPR one, people like NPR and Lawrence, and so books are recommended to them. They have, we have one of those, we have a romance one, we have a mystery one. So just kind of your basic genres. We had our collection development people put together these lists. The most popular ones are the bestseller ones, and we have about, I think every one of them is checked out right now, or pretty much all of them, so I don't, I don't have one to show you. Um, we, the boxes they came in, we just put uh, really heavy duty clear tape on them and are using them, and they, I don't know, it, it was free, but we like those cases a lot. We're probably gonna get the cases like Diana had. I would say Diana was a great help to us. We, we picked her brain a lot because we felt that Baser had a really successful program and simple approach. So we liked, it seemed like they were having a success and we decided we would just do something very similar. We see it very much as a pilot. I mean, we, right now, you know, if you look at it traditionally where our hold ratio is not where we would want it to be, but we're not certain if we really want to buy more at this point. It really is just an experiment with resources that we're sitting around I, overall. I think they're popular. I think of them as an educational tool as well. People can see whether it's something that makes sense to them. And my initial attempt was a thumbing of my nose, my, is that the idiom? Yeah. Colloquialism at the publishers. I wanted to have a Macmillan one and a Simon and Schuster one, <laughs> and one but our much more calm and deliberative staff advised me that we might want to have a more systematic approach to checking them out. But, but frankly, when you look at it from a collection development issue and you're looking about providing ebook content to people, when you can buy a book for ten to fifteen dollars instead of eighty, and an e-reader costs sixty bucks, seventy bucks. What's the return on investment? So we're just kind of experimenting right now. I mean, I think um, I don't care whether they're transitional devices. I think books are a transitional device. I think eight tracks a transitional device. So we're constantly in flux, and that's the world as it exists. And um, we feel like this is serving our users, and we, we are not certain where the future is. Although we do have one thing coming up that we think is going to be kind of fun since we we deliberately controlled the content, and one thing that I really wanted, to me where this would work um, perfectly, or what I would like, is if the person could check the e-reader out and go home, 
decide something they want to read, call us, and we'd magically put it on that for them. But the way that we have to lock them down so people don't do whatever it is that they might do, we can't really figure that out. So we we're trying to figure out how to approximate Brad's dream of ebooks, if you will. And and so what we've decided to do, we we got a grant. Um, grow what we're we haven't figured out the right name yet. We have competing names. One is everyone's e-reader or the community e-reader. But this one, when you when we accumulate or aggregate the whole list, each time you get it, whatever you want to read, we're going to put it on it. And then when you return it, whatever the next person wants, we're going to put it on it. And then we're going to buy like a $500 gift card for each of the two readers. And then when that money is gone from whether it's Nook or Kindle or whatever, there will be a community built e-reader that has content that was driven entirely by customers. So it will be, we're seeing as kind of like an art installation thing as well, just to make it community driven and um, giving people really what they want when they have the device. We haven't worked out. Totally the logistics of that. that. <laughs> <laughs> please do, please do. It kind of, did you come up, somebody came up that was a good idea, I don't know who it was. I'll say it was Karen. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we're excited about it. We just are trying to have fun. That's all I have to say. My turn now. Uh, we had a net, we originally, we bought several no colors, but we did not have the intention of actually using them as e-readers. Our original plan was to just void a bunch of warranties and just install um, an actual Android operating system on them and use them in instruction sessions. So students would have you know, a small portable device and they'd be able to access the internet. Uh, they'd be able to access uh, our databases provided through us or provided through the state library as we deliver information literacy instruction. Um, and so the, the Nook is relatively inexpensive, um, you know, compared to most other uh, small tablet devices. Um, the problem that we got into was that the the student population uh, at Emporia State, um, com coming, you know, many come from rural communities. Um, the you know, and the Android or the the Nooks when we got them were sort of because we got these about a year and a half ago were so sort of, at the time, bleeding edge technologies that most of our students had no experience with tablets in general and with the Android operating system in, in specifically, especially because it was so new. So it was a pretty terrible user experience <laughs> for them. Um, I still, I think I have one of the uh, the rooted ones in my, in my car at the moment um, because it is charging, uh, because it is dead. Um, but eventually what we did decide to do was we had all these nooks and um, not the best experience for instruction to go ahead and um, take ones that hadn't been rooted and uh, check them out to the public. So right now we've had five circulating for the last year. Um, and they have been checked out pretty much consistently. Uh, we didn't put a lot of limitations on renewals and that sort of thing though. So in theory, students could check them out repeatedly and just continue to renew it uh, indefinitely. So I've never actually seen one. Um, and I started, I started in August after classes had started. I think there was one left. Um, and I have not seen any of them since. Uh, so I've been working there eight, eight or nine months now. Um, and I've never seen one um, other than the ones we still have in the back. Um, the Nook is, as, as was mentioned, uh, we talked to Barnes and Noble, um, and like most things in higher education, everything's done by committee. So the committee was a task force was put together to to explore all this, and um, they talked to Barnes and Noble, and Barnes and Noble says that they don't care. Um, so we have five circulating, and they have five licenses, uh, um, or five five copies of the ebook, you know, based on the same license. And what was the term? The, those were the terms that Barnes and Noble said that they were okay with. Um, so so far, it's been successful. Um, one of the things we're looking at in the future is. Depending on how this goes, um, 
to just go ahead and recruit them all and then circulate them that way, um, which sort of gives them, you know, if Barnes and Noble were to go bankrupt or to discontinue the Nook, and the Nook was to die, we still have inexpensive Android tablets floating around for our students that are sort of platform ag agnostic. So if we if we root it out and it's just the Android operating system, you can install the Kindle app, you can install a Nook app. Um, have another way to get to uh, 3M Cloud Library here in the state of Kansas. Um, you know, somebody could put in OverDrive if they wanted to do that. Um, and it, it's been sort of unusual seeing our e-readers there. Um, and it was unusual for me starting there because we have uh, a popular fiction, a browsing fiction collection um, at an academic library. Um, and I think that's sort of been the shift we've been looking at in the past couple of years is not trying to keep up with, uh, you know, we are not a research institution, um, so not having that collection-focused library, but instead being very student-focused and very service-focused. Um, and students have, students want browsing fiction, especially our undergraduate population. Um, and e-books make a lot of sense for us, given the number of people that do continuing education. Um, through the university, so making sure that not only are we providing ebooks, but we're providing a device that allows you to access those ebooks in a um, on a platform that's a, uh, a little bit more friendly to use um, and a little more friendly to read from. Uh, given that reading an ebook on a computer, like an actual computer, uh, on a laptop, on a desktop, is the worst thing in the world. Um, uh, and we've also sort of been concerned with um, accessibility issues uh, because it's it's a pretty major issue on uh, in higher education, is making sure that students that, that need that have uh, accessibility issues, um, their needs can be met. Um, so we also have five iPad ones. Um, so if there's any accessibility issues, that we can always just load up whatever they want on our, our first generation iPads. Uh, well, we kind of hold back um, our iPad 2s that we also have uh, for other stuff because they have cameras and we've been, we've been trying out a few things down there uh, that require the cameras. Uh, the nice thing about the Nook, um, or the nice thing I should say about the, the iPad is that it is the increased accessibility for for uh, for the, the blind or those that uh, that have uh, some sort of vision impairment. Um, and I've been looking a lot at the we've been looking at the EPUB three format, which is they've been talking about a lot lately, which should be completely accessible. So instead of having to wait for um, an audiobook of um, you know some sort of uh, audiobook of uh, Fifty Shades of Grey to come out. Um, you're, you can hear it the way it was intended, which was to have a computer read it to you. <laughs> um, <coughs> so it, it's, been a, it's been a lot of fun um, sort of seeing how this has been working out, but, but given the success of our e-readers, you know, especially students want to come in and check out Fifty Shades of Grey, and we have, you know, we, we want to give them what they want within reason, this has been, this has been a nice way to do that, um, especially based on technology that we, we wanted to try out for something else, um, some, another project, and just uh, being able to use them for, for both things. So it was, even though the Android OS tablet computer space for information literacy instruction didn't work out quite the way we wanted it to, um, fortunately there's, there's uh, still a lot of uh, there's still a lot of fun that can be had, um, especially given the, the robust cloud library here in the state of Kansas um, that is otherwise, you know, for our students who may not have an Emporia library card, the only way to get to that stuff would be through us and without making sort of, without making these devices available to our students, the only way that they'd be able to access it would be on their desktop and I would hate to ask them to do that. Great. We have like 10 minutes. Okay. Hey, CK. Um, Jack, are the other libraries, the other branches, doing what you're doing? They decided not to. The original plan was that we were going to do it first, and the other branches would then jump in. And um, they're far more interested in the Access 360 um, uh, product, and so they decided not to invest in in uh, notes with preloaded content. Okay. Thank you. 
you alluded to stats. I think it was uh, trying to decide to have to count it as one circulation if you, when you circulate the device or however many booklets on it. How do you count that? Uh, we're counting the device right now because we want to see how much they go through. We're also keeping track on a separate, so we could do both. We're keeping track or we ask. We're not keeping track because there's no real way to do that. But we, we ask the uh, part of the survey that they tell us what they've read, and that's more actually for collection development than it was really for stats. Um, but it's just to kind of see what they're reading and then suggestions for it. Um, so we actually have the method to do both, but for our purposes, it's mainly just is it circulating once? The device itself, we're not really okay. too concerned how much they actually read on it, uh, other than for some collection development stuff. Mm -hmm. Oops, I had two questions. One for Diana when they fill out their user end agreement, do you just file it away and do you make a note of that on their account? No, we or just file it. Okay, so and the next time they come in, do they have to sign it again? So then when they come back in, we pull it out of the file and we make sure everything's okay and then that's it. Okay. But they, while they're standing there, we look, we make sure everything's okay. So if they come in two weeks later and want to check out another one, would they have to re-sign? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so they fill it out every Yeah. Okay. We do okay. it for a year. Okay. They, they sign and then you put a note in the account and it's good for a year. Okay. And then, Lawrence, you mentioned locking down. Do you have the business to business plan or? We don't. We what just, do we, I, I wish I knew this in more detail. I, I believe we have an account for, for each reader has its own separate account is the way that we did it rather than having one account spreading the way. We just decided to make it clean and we just, you know, we, we have a library credit card that we buy lots of things from Amazon already and so we just use our, li the collection development people have their library credit card or I think they maybe send the invoice to our actual editions guy. I'm not certain the process on that, but um, we just use the, the customer one um, and we just manage them in house. <clears throat> Jeff, do you have the same titles in all your, you either? Yeah, each device is set up the exact same. Uh, so you, you said like 73 titles? 73 titles yeah. we did on that. Um, so it's only been two months, but if, if it gets to be popular, we'll do some more of the genre stuff. But at this point, we just wanted to, since we kind of had it locked down quite a bit, we just want to give them as much variety as we could so they can just go through and be guaranteed that they could at least find one thing they um, I thought it was like Ms. Barber mentioned that they had contact letters for children and teens. Do you have uh, rules on age limits on those? Um, no, they're just they're just um, children's books and teen books, so just interest. You know, if adults so are interested. Children can check them out, or only adults can check them out. Oh, any of them? I you know we don't really have any age restrictions on any on any of the collections. We just we just decided to experiment and see whether. Uh, readers of whatever age of children's literature and teen literature had, had an e-reader option. And they're not quite as popular as the, I mean the bestseller one is the most popular, the children ones are a little less popular. I wish I had more, <coughs> so yeah, I, I don't, but we just wanted to have a, a breadth of uh, materials available. I have a quick question. <clears throat> Besides the uh, Lawrence Public uh, People's e-reader option, is anybody uh, cons currently considering expanding your ebook, uh, you know, buying more, buying more Kindles, buying more notes, or is everyone pretty much happy where they're at right now? I'm sense? not going to buy any more. I, th I think that whoever said that they're transitional is right. I think, you know, research is showing that most people are buying tablets now, that the ebook market is really falling off by some 30% or something. Um, so I don't think we'll be buying any more. I think we're at a point where we're going to stay. We have an iPad that we circulate in-house, but that's mostly because we have students, so the sixth graders get them now at school, and so um, we have them for the parents and grandparents to come in and look at them um, so they kind of know what's going on. Um, but we kind of set a threshold to where we didn't want to buy anything really expensive to circulate, um, and so I don't see us, even though ours are pretty old, um, we probably won't buy any more except for replacement. I think we'll expand uh, eventually. Um, 
how that'll look, we're not sure. I mean, we, it's kind of young in the pilot, but it's going well enough that we'll either make it a permanent part of the red carpet service just because it fits so nicely with that demographic. Um, but it would be nice to offer um, the ebook content that we can't get right now. Um, so, it, you know, until publishers get on board, which they're more and more starting to crack a little bit here and there. Um, I could see us getting some just to, to do. Um, and I like the, the, the dedicated reader just for that, because it would be more of just, here's something to read. It's not something to play the, if you want the internet, the tablet. I mean, that's kind of the direction we're headed. So. We'll continue adding uh, content to the 10 that we have, I think, without uh, purchasing more. Um, uh, we're looking at you know the uh, cost of tablets as they come down. It'll be interesting if we can we can start investing in that. And uh, uh, my next step, I hope, will be we've really been playing around with Access 360. Um, there are a lot of steps involved in, in uh, finding uh, getting into Access 360. You find something in EPUB or PDF format, go through Adobe Digital Editions and get it onto this thing. Getting our staff so that they could do that. You know, get a couple of stations and you know, start uh, emphasizing that. I think that could be. Could you yep. say a little bit about the, uh, Access 360? Access 360 is a, a Baker and Taylor uh, product of downloadable uh, ebooks, and now they've added uh, uh, audio. That's, uh, and uh, so they have their own proprietary format called Leo that doesn't work on on a, on a Nook. Um, it's it's great in terms of the visuals and stuff like that. Whereas, especially the simple touch is you know we have a black and white e reader there. Um, the Access 360 yeah. content can be used on other devices. Access 360, um, it comes in different, it, it's usually in the, I think it's always in a Blio format, which is their proprietary, mm -hmm. prepared, proprietary format, but then it's often available also in EPUB, which you can put on, on a lot of different things and sometimes even in PDF. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. No, I think, I, for me, I think we've got two different issues going mm -hmm. on. We have people that, you know, that they want the convenience of getting the content at home, and then we have people who they really just kind of want the experience of the e-reader, or like, and so, and so for me, I think it's, we have a lot of people that they just want to come and, and check out the e-reader and read things on an e-device without having to fool with having the device. I mean, I think there's actually more uh, desire for that than we perhaps realized, and I do think it's a trial thing, but also even, I think, you know, I. I think Diana's point was great. Like we're, you know, just thinking about it. I remember when this came out. You know, I mean, I, I, I think it was on my birthday in two thousand seven. I like, I, it was the day that I was off work when it was during the week when it, Google, uh, Amazon announced the Kindle. And they were four hundred dollars, so I refused to buy one. But to me, it was earth shattering the way that an iPad, iPod was for me. Like, I'm the kind of guy who's trying to figure out what fifty CDs I'm taking on a two day trip with me, and I didn't have to anymore, and it was revolutionary. And, I think that's the same thing for e-readers too, and it's like if you want to, you know, you take the e-reader even if it's just you need it for a little while. Um, so I don't know. I mean, we're trying to figure out what the way forward is, and, and for me, I'm always um, I, I value. I, I'm a. I say more times than than people care to hear. I'm serious about stewardship of tax dollars, and I'm always looking at the best way to leverage the money that is so precious that our communities give us, and so. Any way I can get the best deal I can, that's what I'm looking for. And currently, the way that it works with Overdrive, with all these publishers, it's a terrible deal. So I'm always looking for the best deal, and this is one. <clears throat> Could I ask you something? Uh, you, you mentioned ebook kiosk at your library. Just briefly, what is it? Oh, it was just a, a place where we had each of the readers, and you could just play with them. Like, they had a few things loaded on them and you could just kind of see how they work. They were just tethered to a stand. So, and we, we took that down. We're now in a tiny little space and it had kind of served its purpose, but, and we repurposed the iPads and our, our wonderful teen librarian, Karen Allen was like, can I have it? And so we put it in the teen area and the kids play with it. We bought another one, so we have two there and we're looking at having those for, in our children's area as well, just for interactive gaming kinds of things. But we, that's just an in-house thing. I. I, I believe that as a as a consumer item uh, that a standalone e-reader is on its way out, I would agree, but I feel like that we're always talking about reading and, and, and I think it's fine to have a dedicated reader the same way that I think 
chat is kind of on its way out, but it works really well for libraries in a way that we communicate on our web page. I think certain things that may be outmoded quite often can have, have a, 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 a very strong use, um, even if it's old fashioned. Books, they're old, man. They're, turned, they're heavy. There's so many words on the page. It's not do anything. <laughs> just sit there, sit there and look beautiful. Oh. I, I just have one. In your children's section where you have iPads, do you have, have you loaded on there books that are read to the kids so they could sit? We don't have them. I think uh, we don't. They're not out yet, are they? They're not out yet, but they have. They they have all the apps. They're being put on there right now, but okay. they do have. Because there's so many books on the internet that you get with the iPad. Yeah, they have some that read books to you with sound effects and everything. So yeah. that's what I wondered. If they put them in these great like foam cases or something. I was like, what has happened to our iPads? But I guess those are our kids' ones. They're like in some foam block. <laughs> it's kind of fascinating. It <laughs> Stepped on. Yeah. Thank you to all the panel. That was really informative. <laughs>